discover China. He is one of the greatest philosophers in Chinese history. His teachings have become the cornerstone of many Eastern cultures for 2,000 years. He is commemorated and worshipped by countless people. Discover China follows in the footsteps of one of China's most influential and iconic figures in Confucius, the Way of the Sage. On an autumn morning in 551 BC, a child was born to a declining aristocratic family in ancient China. No one could have dreamed of the monumental changes this newborn baby would bring to Chinese society in years to come. At the time of his birth, China was in the last years of the Zhou dynasty. The Zhou king was only a puppet ruler. All formalities representing the ruling orders of the country collapsed completely. The country was split into several independent states. This commenced the struggle for power, wealth, and dominance through numerous wars. It was a time of confusion and disorder. Disharmony prevailed between the rulers and their officials. Many influential noble families took advantage of the chaos to seize power. People were indifferent to each other. Society lacked moral and ethical norms. There were no standards for right or wrong. With such unprecedented changes in people's spirits and beliefs, China was in a transition period from a clan society to a feudal society. An age of many great changes, full of crisis and hope, with new orders replacing the old. It was at these times that Kung Tzu, known in the West as Confucius, was born, who would later promote a unique transformation changed the course of Chinese society for thousands of years. At the age of three in 549 BC, Confucius lost his father and his family broke up. His mother took him to Chufu, the capital of the Kingdom of Lu. They lived in a small street called Chua Li. The Kingdom of Lu was one of the states under the Emperor's rule. It had been said that as a child, Confucius' favorite games were trying to mimic the rites and formal religious ceremonies of his days. In those days, only children belonging to the aristocracy had the right to an education. Confucius, though being poor, still enjoyed the privileges of his family status. Confucius said, when three men walk together, there must be someone I can learn from. I choose to follow what is good in them and correct what is not good. By the time he was 15, Confucius began to regard learning as his primary need in life. Growing up in a poor family in a turbulent society, Confucius witnessed the hardness of life and the bitterness of the people firsthand. He became resolved to devote his life to a goal, 
reforming and bettering society. By the time he was in his 30s, Confucius was well known for his wide range of knowledge among the rulers of the various states. The ruler of the state of Qi, one of the states under the emperor, once asked Confucius how a country should be ruled. Confucius replied, saying that the emperor was like the father in a family. He had the supreme power in a country and, like a father, should be the absolute authority in the family. Keeping in mind the turbulent and disordered society, Confucius developed his views on politics. If leaders will lead people through administrative orders and discipline through punishments, they may restrain people from committing crimes, but this will not bring a sense of shame to the people. Whereas, if they lead through virtue, discipline through religious rites, the people will have a sense of shame and conscientiously try to better themselves. The power of virtue is far more effective than policies and punishments. Confucius said, rulers should rule with virtue. The ruler of the state of Lu had also asked Confucius what specific measures he should take to win over his people. Confucius replied, the people will obey if you give power to the upright and just. During and before Confucius's time, the ruling officials were all wealthy aristocrats, and once their powers increased, they threatened the state's power. After his death, a new intellectual class rose. These intellectuals possessed the ideals and capabilities to serve the country. Since they did not come from the wealthy class, they were not a threat to the rulers. Utilized by the rulers, this intellectual class eventually developed into a civil official group helping to keep the political order and finally became the main political force in the Chinese feudal society for over 2,000 years. Confucius realized it would still be hard for a country to keep a long period of peace and order without common values, as well as moral and ethical standards even though the position of the ruler was secured to a certain extent. Confucius tried to restore the power of the emperor. He tried to prevent war and violence by propagating the discipline of ethics and morals. But in that era of great changes, it was an impossible feat to accomplish. However, whenever the Chinese society tended to be stable, the ideas of Confucius would always be the first choice of policies on governing the country by the rulers. Confucius's political views were favorable for enforcing the centralization of authority, while his ethics became the social norms for the behaviors of ordinary people. This laid a solid social foundation for the stability of a country. In order to commemorate Confucius and preach his political views, Confucian temples made for worshipping Confucius in Chinese feudal dynasties were built in China over the period of feudal society since the Han Dynasty. This Confucius temple, situated in Confucius' hometown of Chufu, Shandong province, covers an area of about 21 hectares with its grand scale, elegant architecture, harmonious and integral design, the temple represents the traditional art and outstanding features of ancient Chinese architecture. Equally grand in scale and standard as the buildings made for emperors, together with its history of construction lasting for 2,000 years, the Confucius Temple is one of the only buildings of its kind in the cultural history of mankind.
This is the outer gate of the Confucius Temple, also called Yangsheng Gate, the gate of admiring the sage. The four characters on the plaque hanging on top of the gate, Wan Ren Gong Cheng, stand for high walls of the palace, meaning Confucius's knowledge is unrivaled. The archway is the first building in the temple. It has an inscription, Jin Cheng Yu Jin. This phrase means that Confucius's ideas have captured the essence of the theories and doctrines of the ancient sages, and that the theories he advocated had reached the pinnacle of perfection. This is Lingxing Gate, the first gate of the Confucius Temple. These three characters were written by Emperor Qianlong of the Qing Dynasty. Their meaning conveys that Confucius is the sage sent by heaven in charge of the literacy of mankind. This stone archway is inscribed with Tai He Yuan Qi. It is to praise Confucius for his thoughts nourishing all living creatures in the world, like the heaven and the earth. The apricot altar is said to be where Confucius used to preach. The stone incense burner in front of the apricot altar was built during the Jin Dynasty. Its style is simple and refined, light smoke curling upwards from the burner for thousands of years. The images of Confucius standing at the altar preaching come to life. According to Confucius, one should establish his goal in life in his 30s and should make efforts and take action to realize the goal. In his 30s, Confucius started what is to be considered the first private school system in Chinese history. Regardless of social status or class, anyone could follow his teachings and get a better education. According to Chinese history, Confucius initiated the right for ordinary people to get education. Teaching has become Confucius's lifelong career. The atmosphere was happy and lively in Confucius's classroom, and you might see this picture depicted. Confucius leading his students to play in the woods nearby, and while taking a break, students sat around him reading books. Confucius, as a teacher, was depicted as always singing and playing music. In his students' eyes, Confucius was stern yet compassionate, dignified, who never lost his temper, always formal in his conduct and graceful in his demeanor. Various Chinese imperial dynasties respected Confucius, and nowhere has it been more obvious than in the imperial court itself. The 13 pavilions of steels were constructed consecutively over a period of 557 years from 1191 to 1748. Standing in the pavilions are 55 steels constructed over a period of over a thousand years, covering the Tang, Song, Jin, Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties, and the Republic of China. Each pavilion is a square-shaped structure of wood. The engravings on the steels are mainly words to respect and honor Confucius. The steels are supported on an outlandish creature that looks like a tortoise. It's called Bi Shi, the son of the fabled dragon in Chinese legends, which was adept at carrying heavy loads. Bi Shi supports only those steels that were built by emperors. Walking through the vast space, 
the people who come here to worship Confucius are rid of the restlessness in their hearts. The tranquility of the temple creates a sense of peace and deep reverence as we enter the temple center. Standing on a two-tiered platform, this grand, splendid, and magnificent hall stands tall. The three characters, Da Chang Hall, inscribed between the double upturned eaves, are protected by a group of gold-plated dragons engraved in the wood. This is the main building in the temple where people pay homage to Confucius. The most splendid and outstanding structures of Da Chung Hall are 10 massive stone pillars under the eaves of the hall. The stonemasons from Huizhou in Anhui province had spent nearly 20 years to carve these pillars during the period of the Ming Dynasty. Each pillar is nearly 6 meters high. Using superb carving and engraving skills for the whole pillar, two dragons playing with a fireball in a sea of cloud are carved onto each pillar. One of the dragons is flying up and the other flying down, both writhing around the pillar. The ten dragon pillars are built in pairs as exact opposites of each other. Each is beautifully carved and majestic. Each is unique, not one resembling the other. East and west side of Da Chang Hall are two long red corridors over a hundred meters long, which helps balance the splendor of the Da Chang Hall. tablet standing inside the quarters enshrined the 156 most outstanding disciples of Confucius and their successors. In the center of Da Chung Hall is the statue of Confucius. Instead of the image of a preacher of righteousness and justice, Confucius's statue portrays supreme dignity for people to pay homage to. Today, after being worshipped continuously for 2,000 years by all the dynasties in Chinese history, Confucius is regarded by many people as the supreme sage. of all dynasties showed great reverence for Confucius by adopting his philosophies for governing their people. The favor bestowed by the emperors to the descendants of Confucius has fostered an unrivaled aristocratic family to last for thousands of years. It has also led to the glory of the Confucius temple. East of the temple of Confucius is the Kong family mansion. The mansion is a unique ancient Chinese aristocratic manor with nine courtyards. It combines the office and the family residence together. Because it is the house for the descendants of Confucius, the rank and ethics systems are represented in the building structure. Along an axis in the center, a series of buildings hosting different functions are spread out according to their primary and secondary orders. They are formed in a strict symmetrical pattern. The office in the front and the family residence behind are clearly divided. The direct descendants of Confucius, who inherited the Kong family manor, lived in the central houses to show their prestigious position.
The family residence covers four courtyards. All buildings in the residence showcase the luxury and elegant taste of the ancient Chinese aristocratic homes. There is a wall immediately after the entrance to the residence. An animal called Tan is painted on this wall. Tan is the legendary greedy animal. The painting symbolizes a warning to Confucius's descendants not to take bribes or break the law, else they will be no different than animals. Confucius had spent his lifetime drifting from place to place full of frustrations. He was accompanied on his journeys by his disciples. Confucius roamed from state to state for nine years during many hardships. He not only failed to get a position from the rulers of the state, but also nearly lost his life. However, Confucius did not lose heart. He remained optimistic and true to his ideals. In 479 BC, Confucius was 73 years old. On a day in April, Confucius called his disciples and said, I will leave you with these books I have compiled. If these books remain, my ideas will live. After I die, I don't want you to stay here, but go out into the world to spread the way of being a true man. The cemetery of Confucius is a clan tomb. It is one of the largest in size, of the oldest in history, possibly the best preserved such tomb in the world. This is the resting place for Confucius, one of China's greatest icons. The tomb of Confucius is 30 meters long and 5 meters high. It is in the shape of a horse's back, which is a high form of honor. This tombstone was set up in 1443, reading, The Tomb of the Master, the most sacred Wen Shuang King, a title of the highest honor. The political views of Confucius have been the supporting and driving force dominating the Chinese feudal society for over 2,000 years. Confucius's principles of ethics, morals, and social norms have formed the main character of Chinese people. Today, the influence of Confucius is felt the world over, as many still choose to follow Confucius's sage ways.